this, uh, this particular church had been a wild church. It had been a church that had all sorts of difficulties, and in fact, it was plagued with division. The, the division was so strong and running through the church that they had experienced all sorts of problems. Some people experienced a lack of food, a lack of care, a lack of pastoral compassion. Other people were experiencing themselves as being on the outs because there were those who were superior and those who claimed to have great ecstatic experiences, great spirituality, great, um, great knowledge and great wisdom. And yet there were strange deaths going on in the church. Along with these things, there was not just the strange deaths and strange ecstatic experiences, but there was also just a whole lot of division and fighting. Now, this could be any church in the 21st century, but the reality is that this was the church in Corinth. And the church in Corinth was a church that had experienced all kinds of struggle, planted by the Apostle Paul, established as a local church, and, and set out to be a beacon of hope in, in the peninsula and where it was located. Yet, as much as it could have been any church today, it's a blessing that we have recorded for us in the pages of Scripture, the very divisions, the very struggles, the very strife of the church of Corinth. The, the blessing of Corinth, you see, is that we get in the midst of her division and, and dissension and, and infighting, we get a picture then of an apostolic response. And the apostolic response is what we need to hear today and, and come back to again. Corinth, you see, they had wanted to find the life of success. They wanted to find the good life, the extraordinary life. And so they had pursued all sorts sorts of uh, attempts to, to know the, the supernatural, to, to know the extraordinary, to, to know the great things. And in their experiences of wisdom and ecstasy, Paul had come to them and commended to them that there was only one thing that was ultimately important. There was one thing that was the key to understanding, the one key that would unlock every door, the one piece of knowledge that would bring together all things. And so Paul resolved, he made it his aim to know what is most important. You think spiritual experiences are most important. What's most important? What's the key that unlocks the door to help us understand how all of life fits together? And what then is the greatest power that we could ever possibly need? And so Paul said that there was one thing that they saw that he aimed to know. Now, when I was preparing my sermon, I came across the irony here that in saying there's one thing that we need to know, I had multiple points. And I thought, that's kind of defeating the purpose of knowing one thing. And so my sermon this morning only has one point. <laughs> Because Paul had one thing that he aimed to know, and it was one thing that we need to know, and it's one thing that we must come back to over and over again. And that is that we, if we are to know anything, it is to know the power of God in the cross. That's all there is for us to know. In Corinth, the, the problem that Paul had encountered, we hear it in verse 1 of chapter 2, that there were these wisdom teachers, sophists, who had come, and, and they were so eloquent and so fine with their speech. We're told that in the ancient world that what, what people would do is that they would pay to sit under the teaching of these teachers, that there was, they were so eloquent, they were so refined, they were so polished, they were so professional. And in this polished, 
polished and professional teaching. They had come and they had commended to the Corinthians that there was a better way, a better way than the Apostle Paul. That Paul had resolved then in, in light of all of these things that he was going to keep his aim on one thing. Now, to, to think that in, in our worlds that there are people who are polished and professional and sophisticated and eloquent in speech doesn't really strike us as odd. We can turn on the TV. We can go to seminars. We can go almost anywhere and find polish and professionalism. In fact, it's so common that it's, it's even part of church culture, that the lights and the show are what people look for. They want the experience of Sunday without the reality of transforming power on Monday. And yet Paul said to these Corinthians, if you are so enamored with these things, I wanted you to know that I didn't come to you to, to be sophisticated in my speech, to be eloquent, to be polished, to be refined, but I aim to know one thing while I was among you. I resolved, he says, and I think it's in the NIV, I resolved to know one thing. This was his New Year's resolution. This was the resolution of his life. This is what he would aim for all of his his days. He tells us in verse 2, I decided, I resolved to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This was the aim of the apostle. Now, we might get the impression then that Paul was lazy or that he he lacked the work effort that he, he should have had. Because in, in saying that he didn't come with eloquence or that he didn't come with sophisticated speech. We might get the impression that, well, Paul just showed up casually in Corinth, opened his Bible, and started preaching and teaching. But we know from other experiences, in fact, we know from the book of Acts, that when Paul went, he went various places, but in Acts 17 in particular, when he went to Thessalonica, that when he arrived there, he, he came and we're told in Acts 17 verse 2, Paul went in as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. This was Paul's pattern. He was no lazy man. He made it his aim to reason, to explain, to persuade. This, was, this is not the language of someone who is lazy or haphazard. When Paul says, I resolved, I aimed to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified, Paul was not indicating any sort of laziness or lack of preparation. What Paul was indicating was that in his preparation, he had sought to diligently study the entire Bible, and that in studying the entire scriptures, the Old Testament that we have, that Paul looked and examined to find Christ on every page. That this was his aim, that he would know Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, knowing one thing doesn't mean that Paul didn't know anything else. It could sound like, well, Paul made it his specialty to know the doctrine of the atonement, and that was it. But that's not at all what Paul sought to do. Paul, though he knew one thing, he, we know from even from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that Paul's knowledge, his knowledge was very, very broad. That Paul could say that he, to the Jews, he became as a Jew in order to win the Jews and to those under the law as one under the law. That he might win those under the law and to those outside the law, he became as one outside of the law. And so this was Paul being culturally sensitive. That, that Paul understood the differences between different ethnicities and races and classes, between men and between women, that, that Paul's knowledge was not strictly in the doctrine of the atonement, the death of Jesus Christ, that his knowledge was very great. 
But rather when Paul says, I aimed to know nothing while I was among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, what Paul is telling us is that all of these other pieces of knowledge, all of this other information, it makes sense when viewed through the lens of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That this is the linchpin, this is the key that unlocks the door. These are the glasses that reveal all reality. When Paul says then, I resolve to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, it was that he was resolving to refuse to be clever and witty, amusing and showy. Why? Why did Paul refuse to be clever and witty and, and, and so eloquent? Because he resolved that if he would practice those types of things, it would dis distract from the message of the cross. Because there is a fundamental disjointedness between polish and the cross. Paul painted no refined picture of the cross of Calvary. It was no sanded cross, but an old rugged beam. There was no eloquence, because that would remove the gore. There was no extreme human wisdom, for that would remove the foolishness of the cross. And for Paul, he knew that Christ would unify all. Christ would bring together the Bible. Christ would bring together the scriptures. Christ would open up an understanding in terms of how we live politically, how we live in our work, how we live in our family. He understood that by, uh, by knowing Jesus Christ and him crucified, it would open eyes to see all of life in light of who Christ is. Why does Paul spend so much energy on the cross? Why does he do that? We, we look at verses 3 and following and we discover why Paul made it his aim to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, and I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What we hear from Paul is something very simple that people with scars proclaim a message of a savior with scars to a world full of scars. It's not eloquent and put together people that can make sense and proclaim an eloquent and refined savior because that isn't who he is. He is one who is despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, one from men, one from men who, who, whom they turned their faces and they hid their faces, who was not esteemed. This is how Isaiah foresees Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53. And so then it is absolutely disjointed to have an eloquent, sophisticated message that focuses on rhetoric and fine polished speech when what is needed is people who have scars proclaiming the scars of the Savior to a scarred world. That's why it makes sense. That's why Paul made it his aim to know that message. It's not a message of rah, rah, let's motivate you and put your life back together that heals people. It's not the pull yourself up by your bootstraps and try harder and dig down. This isn't the message of the New Testament. It's definitely not the message of the Apostle Paul, and it is most certainly not the message of the cross. Because the message of the cross is the message of scars. Eloquence, sophistication, and even professionalism, they do have their place, but they don't have any room at the foot of the cross. The people of the cross, you see, have been marked by the cross. The people of the cross begin to take on a, a cross shape, a, a cruciformity, if you would. 
that our lives then as people of the cross begin to look like the cross, that our lives in looking like the cross become more reflective of the Savior who hung from the cross. Ten years ago, on this Sunday, this was the passage I preached. It was my first sermon here. It was my first sermon here, and I had made it my aim in my ministry, and I had resolved to myself that there would be one thing that I would learn, and one thing that I would know, and one thing I would come back to, which is the cross of Jesus Christ. When I would come back to this passage, it would cut me to the heart. And the desire was that we would grow as a church in cruciformity, that we would grow in being weak, that we would grow in being people who are marked and shaped by Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But the reality is that as much as we have had to learn that, I can honestly say in 10 years that I have had to learn that lesson over and over. I realize even more now than I did 10 years ago how little I understand and how little I am shaped by the cross, and yet how much more I want my life to reflect this crucified and suffering Savior. That it's His leadership, it's His sacrifice, it's His death that inform me in terms of how do I love and serve my wife, my kids, my community and you, my church, that there is so much to learn, so much to grow in, and so much to understand. It's this quote that I came across from Tozer that has struck me, A.W. Tozer said these words, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. God actually rises up storms of conflict in relationships at times in order, to, in order to accomplish that deeper work in our character. We cannot love our enemies in our own strength. This is graduate level grace. Are you willing to enter this school? Are you willing to take the test? If you pass, you can expect to be elevated to a new level in the kingdom, for he brings us through these tests as preparation for greater use in the kingdom. But you must pass, pass the test first. He goes on to say, if we understand that everything happening to us is to make us more Christ-like, it will resolve, it will solve a great deal of our anxiety. And in thinking of Tozer, and thinking about the message of the cross, if there is anything that I hope I've learned in 10 years, it's that I am far more weak than I realize. I am far less gifted than I thought I was. And God is far more gracious and faithful. Because what God is looking for not only in me, but in each of us, is not a sense of giftedness and accomplishment and success and ambition, but he's looking for dependence. And for that reason, the scars that you and I bear in this life are the scars that are intended to make us look more like Jesus Christ. That the afflictions that we experience are intended to weaken us and they weaken us deeply to show us, I believe it's Ray Ortland who says, a pastor from Nashville, he says that if it is these things, that these wounds, these scars that, that come to us, it is so that we might see that there is an operating system of pride and self-sufficiency that God must chip away at. And in chipping away and in refining and, and exposing self-sufficiency and pride and arrogance, that what will happen is that in those things, you will come to a place, you and I come to a place where we realize, I need God even more than I could have ever thought or imagined. That I, I, I can't do this Christian life on my own especially in suffering, 
When I know suffering, then I learn the sufferings of Christ, and I can proclaim the healing power of the scars of Jesus Christ. This is why Paul would say to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12 that he experienced a great thorn in his flesh. And this thorn was a messenger from Satan that had provoked him. And three times he had pleaded with God, take it away, take it away, take it away. But in the midst of that, what Paul learned from being made weak was that, that when we are weak, he is strong, that my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. This is the message of the cross. It makes me wonder why anyone would ever want to be a leader. You want to be a leader? It means death to self. It means suffering. It means dying daily, which is remarkable when I think that anyone serves as a leader in the Church of Jesus Christ. For very early on, I was, I was told by someone, why on earth do you ever want to be a pastor? <laughs> it was the only thing that I felt that God had wanted me to do, and yet I can honestly say after 20 years in ministry, I sometimes wonder that now more than ever. And yet God is faithful. And as I look to Jesus Christ, and as I consider the message of Paul to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified, to, to know that message is to know that Jesus Christ, he left glory, he left honor, and he left praise so that he might face humiliation, shame, and rejection. He leaves all glory, all honor, all praise of heaven to experience humiliation, shame, and rejection. And here is what is so powerful and beautiful, that it is in looking at a bloodied, crucified, and dead Savior, that by faith, when we look to Christ, we see his weakness, we can then say, I'm weak. I'm sinful, I'm broken, and guess what? That's where healing is, that's where forgiveness is, that's where restoration is found. The key that unlocks everything is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So you want to be great? Be the servant of all. You want to wear a crown? Pick up your cross and follow Him. You want to be a someone? Learn to be a no one. You want to have ambition? Then put it to the cross. You see, this is to show that our power is not from us. Paul can say to the Corinthians again in his second letter, in 2 Corinthians 1, 9, this is to show that our power is not from us, but from God who raises the dead. The kind of leadership, the kind of submission, the kind of dependency that doesn't look great and mighty and eloquent, but looks like a servant. Because this power is not from us. It's not about our methods, but it's about our dependence. So it seems fitting on this Sunday, 10 years later, to return here, to remind not only you, but to remind myself, what are we about? Why do we exist? What is this all here for? It's to remember one thing, that all of our lives must be and will be shaped in the shape of the cross as we learn the glory of Jesus Christ. Maybe you haven't hit your wall. Maybe you haven't gotten to that place where you realize the great depths of self-sufficiency and human pride. But God will bring us each to that place. God will bring us to the place of weakness, because in weakness we learn that he is great. We learn that our self-sufficiency must give way to Christ's dependency. Our complacency gives way to a sense of urgency. Our show and our status and our acclamations give way to seriousness. And we can say like the, the, uh, the great preacher that ran before Jesus, John the Baptist, he, I must decrease and he must increase.
You see, the power of God is seen in weakness. For when we are weak, then he is strong. The power of God is seen in our poverty. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because that is when we are made rich. It is God who takes lame people and makes them walk, deaf people and who makes them hear, the, the blind to see, the broken who are healed. And he takes sinners and he turns them into saints. But it is starting in that posture and staying in that posture that grace flows to the lowest place that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If there is one thing that 10 years has taught me, and if there is one thing that I hope you have heard from me, it is this, that we will never leave this message. There is only one point to why we gather. The cross alone is our glory. The cross alone is our hope. The cross alone is where we come back to and we find life in the death of our Savior.